So welcome to this fifth edition of St. John, uh, the Gospel of St. John series. Uh, today is the last one. We thought we would make um, this series in five parts, which is going to be, which has been um, a try. Today, as we announced in the email, we're going to look at uh, one chapter. That's chapter John 6. We take one chapter because it's one chapter. Sometimes um, the content goes beyond the chapters. But in this case, I guess there's, it makes sense that we take just this one chapter, a content which is very, very familiar, although the types of events are very different. And then also there's a very clear limitation to that chapter. In verse 1, um, it says, after this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And then chapter 7, verse 1, it says, after this, Jesus went about in Galilee. So we have the very first verse of the chapters 6 and 7, which pretty much use the same, the same words, which gives, of course, a limitation from the author so that we see, okay, that's a framework a geographical framework, so to say. And then chapter 5, which is just before um, chapter 6, is happening in Galilee. And then chapter 7 is happening at the Festival of the Tabernacles. So we have two very different types of events, whereas the, the 6 is just one entity. Although it doesn't seem like one big thing, precisely, as I said, because there's so diverse... Um, things within that that chapter so what do we have there it's quite easy if you open the bible you can see we have the first one jesus feeds the five thousand men the second one jesus walks on the water the third one jesus has a discourse on bread from heaven and then the fourth one the words of eternal life so we have kind of four parts that would be the general or the typical way how the, your Bible, our Bibles divide um, the text, the, the chapter. We're not scholars, so we'll just keep that division to, so, so that it helps us go through the text. The chapter has the big questions. Nothing very new to St. John. There is a question of belief or not belief. Life and death. And then there's, I would say, an interesting um, relationship between the individual, so I believe in Jesus, and the community aspect, um, especially with the multiplication of the bread, which we kind of have the, the context of a meal gathered around Jesus. And then, of course, we have, and that would be the subject, the theme of John 6, the bread as the symbol of the food, which then is, well, Jesus goes on when talking about the bread. He goes on to the flesh and the blood. Before we, we, we kind of break down the chapter, um, I always give a little elements on, you know, how to better um, not to write, how to better read the, the Gospels. Um, I was talking about the Christology, the way how the Gospels present the person of Jesus Christ. That's one aspect, but there's also another aspect. How do the Gospels present the person of the Holy Spirit? Finally, you could go on with the presentation of God the Father in the texts. That would be also a, a possibility. John is somewhat specific, as um, is often the case, because he can... Uh, I'm sorry, he insists in the, uh, on the point of the Holy Spirit. So he insists that in order for us to fully understand his message, his words, we need an intervention of the Holy Spirit. And he gives a promise. So he says, these are my words, but comes a moment when the Holy Spirit will be given to you, and then you will understand. That would be kind of a a, a, a resume. Um, 
so that we would fully understand. There is a big um, role, a big place of the Holy Spirit in the text that's unique in the Gospels. No other Gospel gives such a big role, such a big place, and such a big hope to um, receive the Holy Spirit, which is understandable because John is the latest text out of the four. So the, the Christian community was well established by the time John was has been written. So the, the importance and the role and the experience of needing the Holy Spirit, of course, was there in the community. So it was a very natural way of, of writing the gospel um, when the Christian community did that. I've already said that, but once more, there's basically two sources of the text of St. John. There's the, the, the Jewish um, approach, and then there's the Christian approach. There's the Jewish tradition, and then there is the Christian tradition and practice. Um, both are present, and both are, are important. And in the case of John 6, those two really need to be thought together at the same time, because if we don't do that, we will surely read it wrongly, or it, we won't get the real message uh, which was written by John and the Christian community who wrote the text. Why is that? Well, because John the six, John six, especially the, the second part where Jesus is giving his big, big speech and then dialogues follow. Well, there's words or there's phrases or there's way of talking, which has been somewhat debated in the history among the Christians. The, the fact that we have to keep in mind both sources, Jewish and Christian, is very important. That's the way how we, the Catholics, read, accept, and pray with um, the Gospels in general, but I would say especially John 6. It is that we do both. We take one and another and not one or another. That's... a a very little thing, a very little element from the history of the church. Uh, 16th century, there was a Council of Trent as, an, as a response to the Luther and, and companions doing the Reformation. And the Council of Trent also talked about John 6. There was a question whether we should read Jesus' words in a realistic sense or in a spiritual sense. A realistic sense would be the sacramental sense. So when, for example, Jesus says, this is my flesh, or if you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood. So the realistic approach or understanding would be Jesus is talking about the sacrament because he says flesh. On the other hand, the other option would be the spiritual sense where the words flesh and blood are not taken as a Eucharist, but as a, a, a paschal sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross where we have flesh and blood and ultimately the death of Jesus Christ. And so the Council of Trent asked the question to the participants whether we should read John, the, John 6 and specifically those verses around you know from 51 and on in a realistic sense or a spiritual sense. The, the Council of Trent had 61 participants 13 of them abstained voting, so they, they, they didn't give a vote. 19 voted for sacramental sense. Nine voted for spiritual sense. But 21, that's the majority, voted for the two together. So it's not one or another, but they said, well, we should, we should read the two together. So at the same time, we read the realistic sense which would lead to the sacrament of the Eucharist and the spiritual sense, which leads to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross together with his resurrection. And basically that would be, that would be in one word, in one phrase or a few phrases, um, my point for, for today. That's why, that's what I suggest though, that, or I'd like to underline um, that we, that's how we have to read John 6, the two together and not one or another. So let's walk through the four parts. I'll especially look at three parts and not 
on the, especially on two parts, I would say, and not the two other ones, but you'll see. So the first part, multiplication of the bread, or let's say feeding of the 5,000, that would be verses one to 15. I don't know if you have noticed, there's six places in the four gospels where we read about the multiplication of the, the, of the bread. And none of those speaks about the place. Where did it happen? Right. The place, I mean, we don't know the, the name of the village or, or the city. It's no wonder that the church in its history interpreted the miracle in a Eucharistic way. First of all, because there's a lot of words which remind us of the Eucharist. And second of all, because it's so present six times in four Gospels. That's, that's a lot. We have, we have four times the crucifixion present in four Gospels, and we have six times the multiplication of the bread present in four Gospels. That's quite amazing. The only thing about what the place is the verse 3, where we have um, an information that Jesus went up the mountain, but we don't know exactly where that was. What is very interesting and what is, I would say, crucial to understand and to rightly accept the narrative is the, the verse, Pass, Passover was near. There has to be a reason for that. Why is that? First of all, because Passover needs to happen in Jerusalem. There's no Passover outside of Jerusalem, whereas the text says Jesus went on the mountain. If Jesus went to Jerusalem, the text would say it. It doesn't say. It. So it's weird. Where does John, other than John 6, speak about the Passover? That happens two times. 2.13, the Passover of the Jews was near, the same phrase as John 6, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And then the second place is 11.55 to 57. Now the Passover of the Jews was near, third time, and many went up from the country to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. And, and so the, the Jews decided to arrest Jesus. So we have the context of the Passover on a mountain outside of Jerusalem, which is quite amazing. I would say even weird. So the other places in John say that when, when we speak about Passover, we speak about arresting Jesus and his death and his resurrection. That's what happens. That's what Jesus announces in chapter two, which would be in the very beginning of the gospel. And then so there's Passover, Jerusalem, so the celebration, but that's also the Paschal mystery of Jesus himself. And then we have two biblical elements. What, the first one is a boy, and the second one is the barley loaves, which reminds, which, which kind of, we have to go back to 2 Kings 4, 42 to 44. And the text there says this, a man came bringing food from the first fruits to the man of God, to the prophet. 20 loaves of barley and fresh ears of grain in his sack. Elijah said, give it to the people and let them eat. But the servant, or the boy, said, how can I set this before a hundred people? So he repeated, give it to the people and let them eat. For thus says the Lord, they shall eat and have some left. He set it before them, they ate and had some left according to the word of the Lord. That's Second Kings 4, 42 to 44. So we have not just the bread, just like that, random bread, but we have bread which was used for the liturgical um, purpose because it was of the first harvest, as the text says. And then we have a miracle, a miracle in the Gospel of John, which is not just a miracle to say, you know, Jesus gave bread to the people to the 5,000 men, but we have this whole context, right? So the biblical context, the biblical background, which is the loaves which were used in the liturgical ceremony. We have the plenty of uh, multitude of bread, and we have Jerusalem as the place of the Passover. So putting all together, we of course have to see there the context, the frame, um, the framework of Jesus announcing what is going to happen with him 
and what is the content of what is going to happen. So there is a community of Christians. That's how we read from a distance, from the Christian point of view. So there's a community of Christians gathered around Jesus, not at bread eating, because we had, you know, we, we were hungry, but gathered around a liturgical event, right? We would call it the Eucharist. Well, it, the text doesn't say it, but we, from a Christian perspective, and knowing this context, can identify such a thing in the miracle. The leftovers, well, the last leftovers as such can be ultimately um, seen as the Eucharist itself. Why not? Uh, there is no objection, real objection to that. So that would be the kind of the context of the, the first part out of the four. The second part, Jesus walks on the water, verses 16 to 21. Why don't you concentrate to the separation between Jesus and disciples and see how the separation is dramatic and has bad consequences. And then second of all, notice that it's going, it's happening on, on the sea, which you know, traditionally with, within the Jewish context is the place of the evil. So the, the water of the ocean is always the place of the demons, the, the, the evil. So if you are in the ocean, you are among the demons, which means you are in the death. You, this leads to the death. If Jesus is separated from the disciples, well, this leads to, to death. But of course, Jesus saves the whole situation. He, he goes to the disciples and he, 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 he's not separated anymore. And all of a sudden, the verse 21, well, they appear to be on the shore, which physically spoken, spoken is not very probable to you know, just jump from the middle of the sea to the shore in you know one single moment. Then we have the third um, the third part, which is the major part, and which is basically the the most famous. Um, that's the Jesus's talk um, in the Capernaum. Let's just go through verse twenty three. A very interesting introduction, which at the same time is a um, not a conclusion, but um, sum up. It sums up the whole, um, the whole vision of you know, what is the context of this whole chapter. Verse 23 says, Then some boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. It's just a narrative. But at the same time, we have three key words, which for a Christian are the most important words for a certain thing. And those words are bread, Lord, thanks. But you got to think about the Eucharist even more because when the text says thanks, it uses the, the verb eucharisto, which means thanks. But that's also the verb which gave the word Eucharist or which gave the name Eucharist to the liturgical celebration of the Christians. So this whole context, you know, starting at at the multiplication of the uh, of the of the bread, which already had a liturgical context, coming to the very beginning, to the very beginning of you know now Jesus is going to speak. It's all about kind of the Eucharist. So we have a definition. This is going to happen in Capernaum. The major thing themes are, um, of course, the bread, the bread of life which came from heaven in the first testament and now the bread of life which is given by Jesus himself and then the the faith in him who is the bread giver those would be two major themes which John um, is speaking about if we take the whole um, it's quite long huh? it's quite long so the whole the whole talk and all the dialogues which are written in uh, well from from verse 24 and on we have two major moments where the story breaks that's verse 35 where jesus says i am the source and verse 51 where jesus says the gift of myself is the source so going from 24 up to 35 basically there's not a major problem. There's no 
no conflict in what he says and in the audience. The question, the, one of the kind of major question, questions is the sign, the type of, um, sorry, the, the question of the, the sign. What type of the sign will Jesus give? Now, it's not a surprise that the Jews ask it, ask for the sign, that they ask him, you know, what kind of a sign will, it, will you do? Moses did the same thing. Jew, the, the Hebrews came to him and the Lord said, um, I'm taking an example of Exodus 16, 4 and 15, very concretely, um, 16, 4 says, then the Lord says to, said to Moses, I am going to rain bread from heaven for you, and each day the people shall go out and gather enough for that day. So that was the announcement of God giving a sign. And so the, the Jews said, well, Moses was the man of God. And God said, I'm going to give you the sign by which you get the confirmation that you are sent by me. And so the Jews said, well, what's your sign? What will God give us as a sign so that we will have the confirmation that you are doing in the name of God? The Jews then with Moses in 1615, Exodus 1615, they were amazed by what they, what they saw. They didn't know it. So they said, mana. I, I don't know. I didn't check what, what was the exact word in Hebrew, but more or less it's mana, um, which means what's that? It's, it was a surprise. Because it, they didn't know what it was. So that's where we get mana. Um, mana basically is what is that? And of course, it was the gift of God. It was the sign of God, which was a confirmation that Moses was sent and at the same time was a physical sign for the people that God is taking care about their lives and then also becomes a very important um, symbol of the word of God feeding the spiritual need of the people. That's all the Jewish tradition up to Jesus. Now, when Jesus says, speaks about manna, speaks about the bread, well, he speaks about the bread, but that's, of course, manna. He is not only making an illusion of a historical element or event, but he is stepping into the present, present, you know, the present moment. So it is now that God gives you all that you need. And he makes an, an, an extension, not only... To, he doesn't stay only within Israel, but he goes on to all the nations. So there, there comes the first problem. And the first problem is verse 34. As I said, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. In other words, he says, I'm not speaking about the gift of God. I'm speaking about myself. And that's the first break in the story, within the story. And that's the refusal, the first refusal. There's two. The refusal of the incarnation. So the Jews, they don't accept that the same God which gave manna and which was a sign of the fact that God is taking care of their lives, they don't accept the fact that now the same God is behind uh, is is behind, uh, is in front of them making kind of the same intervention but way more important the story goes on and it leads to the verse 51 which is kind of the second problem and leads to the second refusal from the part of Jews. The verse 51 says whoever eats of this bread will live forever and the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. So there comes the, the famous word flesh. And then later on comes also the word blood, which makes a question. Is this, is this a real? Is this, is this reading real? Do we really need to read flesh or is it spiritual? And as I said, the answer is both. Both at the same time. So we do Eucharistic reading. But we, we, we must not oversee the spiritual message. In the time of Jesus, when he is giving the speech, when he says the words, there is no Eucharist. There is no death and resurrection of, of the Lord because he's still there. So there's no Eucharistic reading. It's, there's just a fulfillment of the First Testament. And the First Testament is already speaking about giving life to 
the nation. And Jesus only confirms that, and he says, it, uh, he is in front of you. It is he who speaks to you. So it's just a confirmation of what was already announced, what was already revealed. So when speaking about bread and speaking about his flesh, for the listeners around, it wasn't the Eucharist. It was the fact that God is taking care for them. And it was the fact that Jesus says that from now on, it's going to be the gift of himself. And of course, the gift of himself is the death on the cross. Now, we as, as Christians, we also have the Christian and so the Eucharistic perspective. And so we can also read in the flesh and the blood, the Eucharist. But within, in doing that, we also read, of course, this announcement of God taking care of us and God giving life so that we would have life. So there's, there's a clear link between the faith and the sacramental practice. So there is a danger to say when Jesus says flesh, flesh and blood, it's the Eucharist. Well, it is the Eucharist. But what's the spiritual behind? Well, it's, it's an obligation of my faith to say, yes, I believe and I accept it. Because if I don't do that, I only go to the Eucharist. I only receive the communion. And so what? You know, many people do. And many people don't understand what they're doing. So there have to be both. Flesh is not only the Eucharist. Well, it's very, also very biblical. Flesh um, is used in the prologue. The word became flesh and lived among us, 114. So it, it doesn't speak about the substance of a human organism, but it's speaking about a human condition. The fact that the vine becomes um, mortal, basically. Now there's flesh and blood, these two together in Matthew 16, 17, Jesus says, Blessed are you, Simon, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. So we don't say flesh and blood is the Eucharist, which revealed to uh, Simon. It is uh, the human condition, the human nature. Um, eat and drink is not only the Eucharistic, although it is Eucharistic. For example, Proverbs 9, 5 say, um, come eat of my bread and drink of the wine I have mixed. The one who's speaking is the wisdom. Have the, the wisdom as the word of God, the word which is giving to the people to which we have the access. And if, he's, if the wisdom says, come eat, come drink, that means that we do a decision of faith coming to the Lord, which is giving himself to us. So to eat and drink means to accept the gift of God. As I said, 51, especially see the last part of the verse 51, there is a second problem. Yeah? The second problem. And, and the problem is that, is, is it possible that salvation comes from the gift of self, the gift of, of self of a person? So the Jews refuse that. So they refuse not only the incarnation as the ultimate revelation of God, but they also refuse the paschal mystery of Jesus as the source of life for ourselves. So the ultimate revelation of John 6, then I have to kind of go towards the conclusion, is that alliance promised by God is realized in Jesus Christ. The manna, which was given in the desert, and then the law, which was given on the mount, um, is, are only figures which announce the true food given in Jesus and in the gift of himself, so that our passage from the death into life would be realized. Conclusion. Christian community celebrating the liturgy doesn't separate the two senses of John 6. Every liturgical act is an expression of faith in Jesus and of, in faith of, uh, in his gift, in the gift of himself, which gives us the possibility to enter into the communion. The communion is not only an image, it's not only an idea, it's not only a, an, an act of a decision, a mental decision, but it's a liturgy. It's an experience of the liturgy. So I would say it seems extremely difficult not to identify the Eucharistic practice in John 6. At the same time, the Eucharistic practice would be completely in vain 
if it wouldn't be filled with the faith in Jesus' mystery, to which the text invites, to be fed with the sacramental bread and the sacramental wine means to accept the person of Jesus, the Son of God, incarnated and gone to death for the life of the human beings, for the life of myself. So the real faith is not an abstract thought. It's not, it's not something mental, but it's rather an existential relationship between the two. One of them, one of the two is me, is us, and the other one is divine, which I see in front of my eyes, Jesus Christ. So as I said, the, the major point of John 6 for my part would be, well, what is crucial is to read the two aspects together at the same time, not because we would make a decision that it's kind of the best way to read it, uh, to read that chapter, but it's because that's the Christian revelation. The Christian revelation is there's a mystery of Jesus's death and resurrection. And then there's the mystery of the liturgical celebration of the Christians. And these two are one same act to which we um, say yes with our faith.